Conflict between Israel and the Palestinians is a reality that underpins daily life within these borders. Its perpetuity fostering a mentality and a zeitgeist that's unique to this region. On either side exist people who are willing to die for their beliefs. And the idea of life and death is very real every day. Now, as conversations continue around whether peace or even a ceasefire is possible, there are those who have worked on the inside, so to speak, and seen the inner workings of Israeli intelligence and the operations of the militant Hamas organisation. Gonen Ben Yitzchak was the handler of Mossab Hassan Youssef, who wrote the book Son of Hamas. It later, it was made into a documentary called The Green Prince. It details the shift in Mossab, the son of then leading Hamas member, after being recruited to work for Israel Shin Bet intelligence agency. It raises questions about the truth of the reality of this conflict, loyalty, humanity, and who and what each side believes it's fighting for. Recruiting is an art, a very difficult art. You need to make him betray his own people. He asked me, would you work for us? To collaborate with Israel is the most shameful thing. The first day handling him was the first day of the end of my career. This is a big game. No one else knows about you. You will start to lose your sense of reality. He's not just a source. He was there for us all the time. That kind of bond is impossible to break. Al-Qaeda immediately issued a death sentence for him. Go underground, don't come back, ever. I am not who you think I am. And for the perspective of someone with a close-up view of the front lines of this conflict, Gonen Ben Yitzchak joins me in studio. Gonen, a pleasure to have you. Thank you very much. Pleasure to be. Now, for me, what strikes me every time I watch this documentary is that this is real life. Because watching it, you kind of follow it as though it's entertainment. You're sitting on the edge of your seat, watching it as though it's some kind of Mission Impossible, Tom Cruise-style scenario. And then you have to remind yourself while you're watching it that this is real life. Real lives are at stake. And it's described many times, I suppose, by yourself and by Mossab. Sometimes you felt like you were living in a movie. Is that how it feels, I suppose, working on the front lines here working for an organisation like the Shin Bet, seeing what you see every day, that the status quo here in Israel, that it's a reality, that it's not in fact some made-up movie. It's a reality and, and somehow I think the fact that both sides live into this uh, situation of uh, fighting all the time, being uh, obsessed by uh, trying you know, to kill each other or to uh, uh, get along by force, is uh, making us uh, somehow uh, drift from the real issue. And the real issue is how do we see our future in the region? Mm -hmm. We're not very uh, concerned about it uh, in everyday life because we are too busy with killing each other, trying, you know, to sometimes to prevent uh, violence, sometimes, you know, to oppose violence from uh, both sides. Were you thinking that way while you were working for the Shin Bet? Not at all. When I was uh, working for the Shin Bet, I was very into my uh, job. Uh, you know, it was uh, during the Second Intifada, the mm -hmm. Second Uprising, and at that time, we really were very busy every minute in stopping the next uh, suicide attack, the next uh, uh, bombing attack, so... We didn't have time, I didn't have time, you know, to stop and think, okay, what's else? And, and by the way, this was my mission. Right. Yeah. This... And you said, in fact, in the documentary, you said that uh, after Yitzhak Rabin, the then Prime Minister, was assassinated, that's almost what prompted you, you felt you needed to do something. So what was your mission? Um, you know, when I joined the Shin Bet, I knew that I wanted to do something for my, my uh, country, something meaningful. I didn't know what. So... Again, I didn't have any agenda. It's not that I knew that I'm going now to uh, join the Shin Bet to stop suicide attacks. And by the way, when I joined the Shin Bet, the, sec the Israeli Secret Service, I didn't know what I'm going to do. Mm -hmm. I wasn't very familiar with the Secret Service, mm -hmm. like most people. Most okay. people don't really realize what, what's going on. And, and then I found myself, you know, walking within the Palestinian uh, society, uh, trying to prevent uh, suicide attacks. And yes, it's like you live in a movie and, you know, you don't have the time to stop and think about it. Your father had advised you. He said, don't do it. It's a dark organization or, or words to that effect. <laughs> is it? 
Well, it, no, it's not. I, I think the way my father uh, knew the Shin Bet before everything that happened with, uh, you know, what we, we call the bus line uh, 300 and different days at uh, the Shin Bet. The Shin Bet is not a dark organization. It's an organization, you know, with good things and bad things, but definitely it's an organization that most of the people are trying very hard to walk toward stopping uh, suicide attacks, mm -hmm. to, uh, uh, vi uh, stop uh, violence. Uh, it's not a dark organization by any means. And as you pointed to, you were one of the agents working during the, the Intifada, tracking communication between some of the highest, uh, most highest ranking Hamas officials. What did that teach you about the culture of, of Hamas and the way that it operates? You know, I, I was uh, studying about Hamas very quickly because when I joined the Shin, uh, the Shin Bet, I didn't know anything about Hamas. The only thing I knew that they're, you know, they're attacking us, they're uh, doing uh, suicide attacks, nothing more than that. Um, I think that what I know today, what I got to realize during the time, first of all, Hamas is a fundamentalistic organization. And it's an organization that their values are completely different than our values. When I say our values, most people values. They don't appreciate women, okay? They don't uh, see women as uh, equal. They don't appreciate uh, life and, and so on. Now this leads us eventually to the question whether there is any way to negotiate mm -hmm. with the, these kind of people. I tell you the truth, you know, maybe I was uh, invited to, to give an answer. I'm puzzled. I, I don't know. I don't know. I think uh, that it will be very hard uh, to negotiate with them on one side, but on the other side, in Gaza, we have Hamas. This is what we have. Right. This is the monster that is in Gaza, and somehow we need to, uh, I don't know, to uh, control this uh, monster. Right. I don't see the Israeli government doing it. I don't see the Israeli government uh, controlling or trying, you know, to lead the situation. There are all the time being led by Hamas. Hamas decides now, okay, to somehow to retali uh, retaliate uh, the situation in Gaza. Okay, so Israel is retaliating the, the situation in Gaza. We don't see leadership. We don't see an Israeli government that has an agenda for the next five, ten years to say, okay, this is what we need, want from Hamas. We want maybe to uh, uh, destroy them and we, we need someone else to come. We need to negotiate with them, so you know we'll do everything in our hands to negotiate. To tell you what's what's uh, right to do, mm -hmm. I'm not sure I know. In terms of trying to reason with Hamas, I suppose you you have insight into one particular incident, which is with, with Mossab, who uh, became captivated, as I understand it, with the whole process of the Shin Bet when he decided to work for you. Now, uh, he said, uh, he realises, quote, I was living a lie and people are dying because of it. What is that realisation? What is the lie and what is the truth of this conflict? What did he come to realise that he then flipped? It's very hard to explain in only a few words mm. what, what he realised, but uh, we need to understand, first of all, uh, Mossab was sexually uh, assaulted. assaulted when he was five years old. Mm -hmm. His parents were not there. Uh, the Palestinian society was not there. So, you know, today, people that uh, try to accuse him that he is a traitor, let's remind everybody that the uh, Palestinian society and his parents betrayed him so when he was five. So was he a special case? then in terms of the fact that he flipped to the Israeli side and then really believed in the fact that he was fighting against his own family, against his own people and fighting for a cause he seemed to believe in. He's very special and uh, he's very special because he's a super intelligent person. Yeah. I think what's uh, special with him is his ability to, to criticize and ask himself questions about his society, about our society. You know, Mossab, although when you see him on TV, you see someone that really knows how to talk and he knows what he wants, what, what is his uh, message, but he asks uh, questions. Even yesterday, you know, I was talking to him yesterday. Okay. And we started to talk about it. He saw an article in Israel that, that was uh, translated uh, in uh, El Quds uh, newspaper. And in the article, it's written that I said that he's a traitor. Of course, I, I never said that he's a traitor, but anyway, he started to say, you know, maybe I am. Maybe I am, but the situation he I had... He still wonders that to this day. 
Yeah, he, he has more, more uh, question marks than uh, mm -hmm. a, a, anything else. Now, for me, what I find so hard to comprehend, I suppose, is the gravity of these scenarios. How much weight is on the shoulders of these individuals? Let's talk about yourself and Mossad, but, but I suppose I'm speaking to you. You're woken up in the middle of the night and you're told you have half an hour, one hour, two hours to prevent a terrorist attack, and then you start working. And, and the, the, the gravity of these situations is something that I can't comprehend. How do you deal with that? How do you battle that, knowing how many innocent lives are at risk? And it's your job to stop these kinds of attacks. It's very hard, but I think what helps is the fact that uh, this is not a one-person show. It's not my own show. We have uh, an organization behind us. We have the Israeli army, we have the Israeli Shin Bet, we have the Israeli police, all together working, and we have some Palestinians that work with us and help us uh, doing, uh, doing it. Um, they, you know, f from my point of view, I understand why people, you know, maybe uh, see, see them as traitors, but actually these people are, you know, they are stopping violence from uh, both uh, sides. Um, and they are part of, of what uh, we're doing. And we're talking at the moment, of course, about perhaps a, a, a ceasefire being negotiated between Israel and Hamas, brokered by Egypt and the United Nations. How much secret com communication, though, is really happening between Israel and Hamas? A lot. A lot. There is a lot of uh, negotiation. You know, this uh, government is saying we don't negotiate with Hamas. Well, actually, for a long time, maybe 10 years, uh, they are negotiating with Hamas, which by the way, again, I'm not saying it's bad, but I do think that they need to know what are their goals. You, you can't just walk from ceasefire to ceasefire. You need to understand, if you're going to ceasefire, if you know that this is uh, the leadership of Gaza and you're talking with them through, the, through Egypt, Germany, whoever, do something in order you know, to, to uh, prevent violence and, and get people hope. So what's then the agreement between the two sides, if there is this communication between them? Well, I, I don't know what is the agreement, but I do know, I do know that right now there are so many Palestinians, young Palestinians, between the ages of 18 and 45, that are unemployed. So in this uh, big prison that is called Gaza, what do you expect from uh, Palestinians to do? They don't have work, they can't bring uh, money to their families and food. Sure. What, what can they do? What choice do they have other yeah, than listen to Hamas? Is, oh, right. Now, just briefly, what do you hope that people take ho home, I suppose, from the coming together of you and Mossab? I really think there is hope. Not hope in a very naive way that Palestinians and Israelis will start hugging and then kissing each other. But I think that both of us, we came from really two opposites. My father was a general in the Israeli army. His father, one of Hamas founders, we are the best friend, really best, he's more than, than a friend, he's mm -hmm. really family. My, my children. Yeah, the, he, he's family. an uncle. Mm -hmm. He's an uncle for, for my, my children. And mm -hmm. this is the, the way we see him, he's part of the family. There is hope. Right, and perhaps it might need to be done that both sides somehow come together, or perhaps as Mossab even tried with his father, it has to be uh, done on the inside to try and convince yeah. your own people that perhaps there is another way. In Gone both in. sides. Really, <laughs> absolutely on both sides.